Open up your Bibles, Mark chapter 6. If you need a note sheet, you can get it on the way in, or you can, or those of you online, your online host will direct you accordingly. Uh, we're in this series through the Lenten season where we're looking at various disciplines, spiritual practices, and last week we looked at the discipline of fasting. How's fasting going? Wow, outstanding. <laughs> I heard there was some great conversation. We had a great conversation, a group of men Friday morning early in the atrium. We were together talking about fasting, and then Pastor Ted told me about how Carter Spear led an outstanding discussion in their Wednesday night small group about fasting. Is that right, Ted and Carter? Way to go. And so, how about in your groups or in your homes, if you work in the muscles of, we talked about, we reduce, like we stop eating food to be reminded what Jesus said in Matthew 4, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So, Jesus basically has this vision that if you're following God, if you're worshiping God, you're a fasting person. And so, that's why we, we looked at that last week. And so, if you, if you had a rough start to it, guess what? You get to restart this week. Give it a try. If you've never fasted before, what's the worst thing that can happen? Well, you're going to get a little hungry. you feel it, but maybe you'll meet God. Maybe God will do something. And so, give it a shot this week. Maybe try a meal or a day, or I'm doing kind of a sun up to sundown fast on Wednesdays and Fridays. So, anybody want to join me in that? You're welcome to do so and check in on how that is going. And the first round of all of that was everything I talked about last Sunday, right? Physically challenging, trying to stay with it to get to the more spiritually fruitful components. And we're holding a question before us all through the Lenten season. Here's the question How are things with your heart? How are things going in here? And to help us talk about that, we've kind of set this diagram before us. This diagram represents what it means for Jesus to renew and reform and reshape a heart. That he uses things, truth, focal practices, and community. So the top of the diagram, truth, what that means is we talked about last week false narratives that sometimes we just adopt, adopt through family of origin, through the brokenness of our own life, through decisions we make, through the cultural air that we breathe. We adopt these false narratives, and one of the ways Jesus addresses the heart is He invites us into His kingdom narrative in His Word, and He says, hey, reform and reshape your thoughts and your mind through this God-breathed book. That's truth. And then you dovetail that with community, and you ask the question like, who are you surrounding yourself with? Are the people you're surrounding yourself with representing a life that's living, flourishing in Christ? Is that that happening? If that's the case, those are the people you want to surround yourself. Like the baptism, isn't it a beautiful picture of those in the water and then those around the tank? Uh, the, The tank represents that community dynamic, spiritual family. People are saying yes and amen to Jesus and that we do this together. And then the third element of the triangle is focal practices. These are what some traditions call spiritual disciplines, sacred rhythms. I want you to think of them as habits that Jesus taught and modeled. If we want the life of Jesus, we've got to adopt the lifestyle of Jesus. That's what focal practices are. And so Jesus was a man who fasted. He fasted 40 days after his baptism. Good thing we didn't commission this group, right? Right after Jesus' baptism, 40 days in the wilderness for fasting. That's not how we commissioned the group up here, but that's what happened to him. And some amazing things occurred. And so he he has this vision that if you're going to be a a person whose heart is being formed and shaped in the way of Jesus, fasting is going to be a rhythm that you're going to practice. And then today we're looking at another rhythm we're looking at called solitude. And at the center of the diagram is Holy Spirit, because here's what we want to say about renovation of the heart. We've got no shot to change the heart without God's power and presence. If this all things new… By the power of the Holy Spirit, Christ in us is how all things become new. We've got to be clear about that. This isn't like a self-help program with some nice music and a book study. That's not what the church of Jesus is. This is about us centering ourselves and opening our hearts to the power and presence of God through the Holy Spirit to come and transform and renovate a heart. Do you believe that's possible for you? Whatever you walked in here with, whatever you're carrying, do you believe Jesus can touch you right where you're at and make it new? One of the conversations I was having at the tank with the folks in the waters, I said, when you go under the waters, one word, release. Let it go. It dies here, under the water. 
1.0 life. Old ways, old self, old stuff. Right there, it stays right there under those waters. It's united with Christ in His death. Christ paid for it. It's washed. It stays here. And then when you come up out of the waters, one word, embrace. You just keep saying a wholehearted yes to Jesus. Baptism is one yes, and you just keep saying yes. Embrace what He has for you. Release and embrace. Do you know that kind of a heart is only possible through the power and presence of the Holy Spirit? And so what you witnessed today, a bunch of folks who had an encounter with the living God, and that's available to anyone, and maybe for you today. Maybe that's why God brought you, is for you to have a personal encounter to make something new in here. And one of the ways God does that is He invites us into a practice called solitude. Here's three favorite resources I have on solitude. Here's a picture of the book. So three of my favorites, quite a bit of the content from this morning comes from these three resources. Way of the Heart by Henry Nouwen, outstanding read, not a long one, something you could do fairly easily. And then Invitation to Silence and Solitude by Ruth Haley Barton, another outstanding read, again, not super thick. And then the last one, Souvenirs of Solitude by Brendan Manning. Very candid, very transparent. I appreciate how Brenda, Brendan Manning writes with a level of transparency and authenticity. And so there's the three. If you're looking to take some deeper dives in that, I commend those resources for you, and I put the titles there on your note sheet for you. Blaise Pascal, a famous French philosopher, Catholic writer, and physicist in the 1600s, here's what he said, quote, all of humanity's problems stem from man's inability to sit quietly in a room alone. Think about that. I can just testify that 30 years of pastoral ministry, a good chunk of the work that I'm involved in has to do with people's inabilities to sit quietly in a room alone. This past week's Thursday edition of the USA Today, here's the headline. Mental health crisis fuels the post-pandemic rise in medication use. It intrigued me enough to open the article, and it began to describe basically the prescription rate for mental health drugs is outpacing all other prescriptions by several X. And then one of the physicians and psychiatrists they interviewed said this, this quote, quote, we're coming to the point for many where life has become unmanageable. Where life has become unmanageable. As you've heard me say many times from this stage, God's address is found at the end of your rope. If you've come to the point where you feel like the way you're running your life is unmanageable and unsustainable, I want to tell you right now, you are right where God wants you to be to experience a new beginning. Because Jesus meets us right there in the place of the unmanageable. And he does it in what Henry Noun calls solitude as the furnace of transformation. He invites us, as Xavier read the teaching text, to the desolate place, to the solitary place, to the wilderness, to in Greek it's called the eremos. He invites us to the solitary place and he says, I will meet you there. Anne Morrow Lindbergh, this is, uh, yes, Charles Lindbergh's wife. Here's what she said about solitude. As far as the search for solitude is concerned, we live in a negative atmosphere, as invisible and as all-pervasive, as enervating, which means draining, as high humidity in an August afternoon. Listen to this line. The world today does not understand the need to be alone. Well, Jesus understood this. And he was inviting the disciples in Mark 6 into an experience of a need to be alone. And they're riding the adrenaline in Mark 6. So if you've got your Bibles open, you kind of just scan through Mark 6 now, and you're going to say, there's some holy, crazy stuff going on in Mark 6. The disciples have been commissioned and sent out by Jesus to do the work of the ministry, to complete the Great Commission, to pray for folks, to preach the gospel, to anoint the sick, to do all the things. And they were doing all the things, and there's a lot of stuff going on. Look at verse 6 and 7. Jesus went around teaching from village to village, calling the twelve to him. He sent them out two by two and gave them authority over evil spirits. Verse 12 and 13, they went out, preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick with oil and healed them. 
And then right in the midst of all that crazy ministry going on, sick people being healed, evil spirits being driven away, gospel being preached, right in the middle of all of that, King Herod orders John the Baptist to be beheaded. And so one of the more early martyrs in the church, he's executed. And he was like a mentor, kind of a guide, a spiritual leader in the lives of these young followers, John the Baptist. It had to be an incredible hit. Talk about grief and loss. And so, verse 30, look at Mark 6, verse 30. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to Him all that they had done and taught. So they come to Jesus with this ministry report, and they're like, hey, Jesus, like, we preached the gospel to this crowd of people, and we invited people to come and repent of their sin. Like, Jesus, do you know what happened? Jesus is probably thinking, yeah, I kind of do, you know, know what happened, but go ahead. It says, people like came forward and confessed their sin and gave their lives to Christ. Like, it was crazy. And, so, and then Jesus, like, we met a person who was like just completely overtaken with like a demonic spirit, like an evil spirit, just tormenting their life. And then like Jesus, we gathered around him and we prayed like you taught us to pray in the authority of your name to drive out the evil spirit. That Jesus, do you know what happened? The evil spirit left and the man was restored to his right mind. And then Jesus, we like went to another village and we saw this young girl and she was like paralyzed. And so we remembered what you said about like anointing the sick with oil and praying in your name. And do you know what happened? We prayed for this young girl. We anointed her with oil. We asked you to heal her. You know what happened? She got up. She walked. She began to celebrate and praise God. Jesus, it was this holy, crazy stuff. They're just going through their ministry report. Right in the middle of all this ministry report, here's what Jesus said says to them, verse 31, the Xavier read for us. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place. Some of your translations say solitary. Some of them say desolate place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. Do you see what, uh, what an unbelievable moment, what a, what a moment to invite them into the furnace of transformation called solitude. So right in the middle of abounding in the work of the ministry, Jesus draws their attention to the abiding rhythm that will sustain the abounding. He's teaching them abide, abound rhythm, abide, abound. I taught on John 15 several years ago, and this was the language I used in John 15, abide, abound, abide, abound. This is a picture, Jesus says, in order to sustain the physical, emotional, spiritual, and relational, like currency you're going to need, the strength you're going to need to carry out this ministry for the long haul, you're going to need to learn to abide. You're going to need to pull away from the abounding and prioritize the abiding. It reminded me of a, when I was probably, I don't know, 26 or 7 years old, I'd been in the ministry a couple years, and Pastor Kerry took us away to a conference, and this pastor, who many respected so greatly in the country, stood up in front of, I don't know, five, 6,000 of us in the room, and he said, I get so busy doing the work of the ministry, doing the work of God, that it's destroying the work of God in me. Whew. That was like a, whew. At 26, 27 years old, there's an invitation to abide, abound. And so, I don't know, it was a few years ago, I think Pete, Pete Scazzaro's influence on my life, I adopted a little mantra that I share with the staff quite a bit. I think I first heard it from Pete Scazzaro, author of Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. He said, what you do matters, but who you are matters more. It's basically Jesus trying to teach them this at this past, like, hey, hey, what you're doing, all of that wonderful ministry and all the reports you're doing, that all matters. That's all good and important and necessary work. But there's something that matters even more. I want to invite you to come away to a solitary and quiet place. And the crowd and the abounding of all this ministry, it can wait. There's something that can't wait. And that's the abiding work. So abiding in the solitary place is where we find the sustaining strength to abound in the public space. So if you hear anything else from this whole text and this conversation that Jesus is having, I think he's trying to pull the disciples and say, hey, gather around and say, hey, I wanna teach you about something. Abiding here in the quiet, solitary place is where you're gonna find the sustaining strength for all the abounding in the public space. It's the abide abound rhythm. And I feel like it's every week that I 
go on Christianity Today and I scroll the headlines and read the articles, I feel like it's about every week that there's a latest headline from some pastor, author, theologian, professor, someone who's had to resign from their position of spiritual leadership because their lifestyle no longer reflects the values of Jesus and the ethical standards of the Bible. I feel like it's about every week. And I don't say that with any judgment in my heart. I say that with a soberness and an empathy. An empathy for those that are affected by those kinds of falls. And, and then it just, it just kind of thrusts me into this space where you just go, I, I think there's a pattern. There's a pattern that goes something like this. The pattern is a pastor steps forward and begins to do a bunch of ministry in the name of Jesus because God's called them to do it, and then a whole bunch of abounding goes on. There's like a whole bunch of fruit that goes going. There's a whole bunch of good stuff. It's like what Mark 6, there's like people being healed, and there's people getting baptized. There's people coming to Jesus, and there's, there's all kinds of abounding going on, which requires the pastor to be leading even more, which fuels even more abounding, which requires more leading, which fuels more abounding. And somewhere along the way, in that cycle, there's an erosion or a drifting from the abiding that was so central in those early and younger years that first thrust the abounding. Something. That's just my general assessment. Because here's what abounding in the work, of, the abounding and the more abounding that goes on, it causes you to be very outcome driven and fruit focused. Because there's so much going on and there's so many needs. And when you look at the cultural moment we're living in, we need the power and presence of God to fall. We need revival and awakening to come. We need a massive amount of abounding. But here's the tendency. You can get so focused on what you long to see the fruit to come and the outcomes you, that you can lose sight. And Jesus is saying, hey, guys, you got to get away with me. you got to get away to, the, to this quiet, solitary place. Because if you don't, here's a dangerous place you can get to. You can mistake adrenaline for the blessing of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to say that again. Adrenaline can mask what you think is the blessing of God. It could just be the hit of adrenaline for more and more abounding. You got to keep abounding to get the adrenaline hit, and you think it's about the power and presence of God when there's really no abiding going on. So Jesus says, hey, in the midst of all your abounding, you got to get away to this quiet place because we got to make sure the roots are going to go down deep in the abiding that sustains and fuels. It's not adrenaline. It's the power and presence of God in your life and through your life. I think that's a pretty big lesson he's trying to teach. I know for me, a good sobering lesson and reminder that strength for all the public abounding is going to be found in the solitary place of the abiding. Because there's something in the fallenness of the human heart that wants to put all our energies into doing great things for God. There's tremendous momentum when you give your life to Christ and He begins to make all things new and you experience His forgiveness and grace. There's all this momentum. You're like, I want to do a bunch of stuff for God. It's wonderful. But here's the danger is that you can get so driven by all that abounding and doing great things for God that you can mistake adrenaline for God's blessing and lose sight of the abiding. It's one of the many reasons I'm so grateful to be a pastor here at this church. We're not perfect by any means. We've got plenty of things to work on, but one of the things I've appreciated in the many years here is that we as a congregation and our leadership, our elders and our staff, like we try to pay attention and prioritize the abiding rhythms that sustain the abounding. We don't always get it right, but I'm saying we try. Like, do you know that staff members here at Eagle, that we're paid four hours every month to be alone and be quiet and get to the solitary place with God? Do you know that? Every staff member full or part-time, four hours a month, go away, get quiet, get with God, experience solitude with Him. That's why we start our week here as a staff. We start it in the prayer room at 10 a.m. on Sunday morning. If you ever have a free, or sorry, 10 a.m. on Tuesday morning. If you ever have a free Tuesday morning, you're off on a day, you want to join us in the prayer room at 10 o'clock, you can join us. We have it from 10 to 11. We're there worshiping, praying, committing the week to the Lord and our lives to Him. That's why we do that. 
That's why we have a 9 a.m. prayer set in here before our 10 a.m. worship gathering, before the abounding in the work of the ministry, all the ministry that's going on in the, the building this morning. We need a 9 a.m. prayer set to drive the roots of abiding down that sustain the abounding. Do you know that's why our elders set a sabbatical policy many years ago that the pastoral staff every seven years would have a period of time away for the quiet, desolate, solitary place to abide. That's why we close the office on Mondays for Sabbath. All these things, all these things are our attempt to simply keep Jesus' abide, abound rhythm in front of us, that you can get so busy doing the work of God that it starts shriveling up the work of God in you. And it's our attempt to say, hey, what you do matters. Of course the abounding matters, but who you are matters more. It doesn't matter more than the abiding. Because listen, listen, If you've checked out, come on back for a second. When you get to the end of your one and only life, do you know what you're going to stand before the Lord and present? You are not going to present the abounding. You're going to present the kind of person you've become, the abiding. That's what's going to matter 100 years from now. And I feel like Frederick Nietzsche put his finger on this when he got together with a group of Christians. You know Nietzsche, those of you in school settings, and you do a lot of philosophy and science. He was a well-written, well-known atheist and philosopher. He did a lot of writing on a lot of topics, was a brilliant man. And he got around a group of Christians, and he wrote this little summary after being around them. He said this, you redeemed don't look like you're redeemed. You're as fearful, guilt-ridden, anxious, confused, and adrift in an alien environment as I am. I'm allowed. I don't believe. I have nothing to hope for. But you people claim you have a Savior. Why don't you look like you're saved? Oh. I think one of the answers might be we've got so caught up in the abounding that we've lost sight of the invitation to the solitary place of the abiding. I think that's one of the answers. Certainly not the only answer, but one of them. So Jesus says to him, hey, guys, Time out on the ministry reports. They got their own little congregational meeting going on. He calls a time out in the congregational meeting. Says, hey, we rejoice in all that's happened. Let's get off to a solitary place. Look what happens now, verse 33. But many who saw them trying to get to the solitary place, they recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. So what they thought was going to be a desolate, quiet place was a crowded and noisy space. Some of you are like, that's my life. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. So he, he's trying to lead them to a solitary place. He gets there. It's not so solitary anymore. And I feel like, isn't that real life? Those of you parenting younger children, like the preschool parenting years, like the concept of solitude and solitary life is like flaming snowflake. Like, And others of you, you're just going through some really challenging circumstances at home, on the marriage and family front, on the career front, maybe with your physical body. You've got a lot, like real life comes, have you noticed, it can get relentless. Like just as you try to like pull away and to take some deeper roots, try some fasting, begin to step into solitude, come to a prayer set, begin to seek God, have you noticed like life doesn't just quiet down and carve out this wonderful space for you. Life meets you there, and Jesus, I think, models this. And right in the middle of it, he doesn't doesn't turn a blind eye to them. He has compassion on them. He serves their needs. Remember, it's been a full day already, and this is the setting. In your Bibles, do you notice the heading? If you have an NIV, it says the feeding of the 5,000. So Jesus sees the day is getting late, the people are getting hungry, and he turns to the disciples. It's like, hey, we've got a big crowd to feed, 5,000 men, which means probably 15 to 20,000 in the gathering. So you go… There's a lot of people here to feed. What do you got? Uh, I've, got five smi- I've got five loaves of bread and two fish. And Jesus says, bring it here. And then he multiplies and he feeds the 5,000. And they're feasting. The miracle of the feeding, right here in the midst of that. This, the feeding of the 5,000 comes on the backside of trying to lead his disciples to a solitary place for abiding and thrusts him into more abounding. Hmm, that's life right there. And then look, lest Jesus is deterred from all this. Verse 45, immediately, notice immediately, Jesus made his disciples, notice made, 
Let me pause there for a minute. Do you know Jesus certainly respects our free will? He's a gentleman. But do you know there are times in which out of His great love for us, He presses us to do something, like He makes them. That's not called controlling. That's called being a loving Savior and leader in our life. Like there are times I just need Jesus to make me, like Simpson, you just, boom, you need to. He makes them. He's like, hey, they're probably all well. They've added another chapter to their ministry report. They're like, hey, we went from healing people and seeing demons cast out and salvations. Now we've got feeding of the 5,000. Like this is a cra holy, crazy ministry. We just add another chapter. And Jesus is like, hey, guys, I'm going to make you right now. You're pulling away. Made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida. Bethsaida is like on the north side of the Sea of Galilee while he dismissed the crowd. So Jesus says, I'll handle all the stuff going on here with all this abounding stuff. I'll handle it. You go off and get to the quiet, solitary place. So even though the circumstances were challenging, even though they kept throwing curveballs at him, it did not deter Jesus from getting the guys where they needed to get to, to the Aramos, to the desolate and quiet place. And so I'll draw this together this morning. I wrote three sentences at the end of this section that just were for me, from my personal experience and solitude over the years, three things that I've seen are harvested out in my own life and journey and then trying to help you through the years that I've seen God do in the solitary place. Three things, and we'll draw it together with this. Solitude helps me be present to what's real in my life. Like Ann Lindbergh said, that I don't realize how much I need it until I get there. And what I need to be is present. Listen to how Ruth Haley Barton put it. I put this quote in your notes. To celebrate the joys, grieve the losses, shed my tears, sit with the questions, feel my anger, attend to my loneliness. This, notice, being with what is, is not the same thing as problem solving or fixing. Hear that. It's not that. It's being with what is because not everything can be fixed or solved. Rather, it means allowing God to be with me in that place of waiting for Him to do what is needed. Church, can you think about the emotions these young disciples had to feel at the end of that day? Can you feel it? The joys of what they got to witness, and then the incredible grief and sorrow of John the Baptist's beheading and the loss and the sequence of days surrounding that. The, the volume of emotions that were racing through the interior world of those disciples, Jesus says, guys, you cannot process that in the busyness of your everydayness. You've got to get to the quiet and solitary place. And for some of you, that's where this morning finds some of you. Some of you are personally going through some stuff in your life and you know it. You have recently said goodbye to someone you love. It might not have been as extreme circumstances as it would John the Baptist. And then think about the anger they had to have towards King Herod. They had to work through grief of losing John and then anger towards Herod and then rejoicing at all these people who've come to Jesus and then rejoicing at someone who's walking who didn't used to walk and then rejoicing of someone set free and all that stuff. Some of you right now are right there. You're dealing with some things that simply put... A counselor's office is not going to fully touch. I'm all for counselors and therapists. I've been to a few myself. Necessary and important. But listen, Jesus is modeling and inviting disciples. There's some stuff that needs to be processed in here that isn't going to happen until you get to the solitary place. And you get there, and you quiet your heart, and you get clear on what is real in your life real. You get alone and you get quiet and you open up the experiences and you process it in the presence of the Lord. And there's just some places in our heart that can't be healed any other way. And if that's where you're at, I want to invite you. One of the most practical things you can do right now, if you're in a place you're like, I, I need to get to that... Why don't you prioritize coming at either 9 a.m. on Sunday morning or 7 p.m. on Wednesday night in the Lenten season and just come? You know what one person said to me at the end of Wednesday night's prayer set? One person said to me, they can't recall how long it's been since they've sat quietly in the presence of the Lord for one hour and the impact that that has. Bring your Kleenex, 
Bring your journal, bring your Bible, and bring your heart and sit before the Lord. The alternative is to kind of push all that away and power through. Here's the danger of that. When you push and push and push and just keep powering through and you know there's a bunch of stuff, you know you've got some things to deal with in here, but you're like too busy, too much, too stuff. When you do that too long, you know what starts happening? It starts bubbling up and leaking out in less than helpful and tend to be more harmful ways on the people in your life. Here's a little dashboard indicator for me that I have. When I have a level nine reaction to a level two situation, I got to get to the solitary place. You tracking with me on that? Like, it's not that it wasn't a situation. It was like a level two though, and I went level nine. It's like, what's going on? There's a little dashboard for me, a little light that says, hey, I got to get to that quiet, solitary place, and I got to get real with what is with the Lord. Secondly, solitude reminds me to wait on God and let Him fight the battle. So solitude is the place where I step off the treadmill of producing, accomplishing, creating, defending, analyzing, judging. I confess last week I'm an Enneagram One. Enneagram Ones love all of those words. But I got to step off that treadmill. And I'm reminded this. There are some battles that only God can fight. And you know where I learned that? I learned that in the quiet and solitary place. It's what the Israelites found, Exodus 14. It's like the visual for this. They're on the banks of the Red Sea. The Egyptian army's coming over the skyline, right over the hill. And like, Moses, what's up? We got an uncrossable body of water here. We got a really hostile army here. And you know what the Lord tells him? Exodus 14, 14, here it is. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. That does not seem super practical. I promise you nothing about your life and your calendar will ever say it seems really practical to get away to the solitary place. But if you get there, you'll find out that there's some battles you're working through that are the Lord's and the Lord's alone to fight. On a really practical level, I learned that in the solitary place. And then thirdly and finally, solitude removes the scaffolding from my life. When I get to the quiet place, I get with what, what's real in my life. I learn which battles really are the Lord's to deal with. And then thirdly, there's the scaffolding that kind of gets dismantled in solitude. And Henry Nouwen says it better than I could say it. So I put this quote. It's a bit lengthy. Stay with me. I think it's worth it. No friends to talk with, no telephone calls to make, no meetings to attend, no music to entertain, no books to distract. Now, he wrote it several years ago, so let me add. No cell phones, no social media, no Netflix. Just me, naked, vulnerable, weak, sinful, deprived, broken, nothing. It's this nothingness that I have to face in my solitude. As soon as I decide to stay in my solitude, anybody had this experience? Confusing ideas, disturbing images, wild fantasies, and weird associations jump about in my mind like monkeys in a banana tree. Oh my gosh, how true is that? Some of you, that's like your prayer life. You try to pray, it's like monkeys in a banana tree every time you try to go to prayer. Anger, greed begin to show up. They're ugly faces. I give long, hostile speeches to my enemies, and I dream lustful dreams in which I'm wealthy, influential, and very attractive, or I'm poor, ugly, and in need of immediate consolation. <laughs> Thus, I try again to run from the dark abyss of my nothingness. Hear this. The task is to persevere in my solitude, to stay in my cell until all my seductive visitors get tired of pounding on my door and leave me alone. There's the invitation, church. The scaffolding, you tracking with that imagery? Like the things we just reach to. Try to cover over. Food being one of those, that's why fasting is often important to do with solitude. Like you just remove that scaffolding of food. And, and then the digital detox, and you remove that scaffolding, and you remove relationships, you remove noise, and all these things, and you just get stripped down to you and God, and what's real, and who's battle, and do you see that? That's what you find in the solitary place. So I want to invite you. I want to invite you to heed Jesus' invitation. 
an invitation in the middle of whatever abounding is going on in your life to an abiding that whether you realize it or not is actually going to be the strength and the fuel for anything abounding that's going to go over the long haul. Worship team, why don't you come on back up? I'm going to close with one final poem from Brennan Manning. It was in his book, um, Souvenirs of Solitude. I put it in your notes because I thought it was something you might want to reflect and meditate on this week. If you've never practiced solitude before, here's what I want to invite you to do. This week, or if you can't do it this week, sometime between now and Easter. Can we make that? Sometime between now and Easter. We've got like four weeks of Lent left. Would you just say, I'm going to find two to three hours somewhere on the calendar, block it off, and then change of place along with the change of pace. You've got to change the place sometime. Like find a physical space to go to that helps fuel disconnecting and solitude. So the prayer room's available to you here. That's a great solitary place. Find a space that helps fuel some quietness. Like Jesus, you notice he was trying to get him physically away from that. Probably your home, especially those of you with younger children at home, the home's probably not going to be the domain. You have to try to find somewhere else. But pick two to three hour window somewhere between now and Easter and just get with Jesus in the desolate Aramos. Could you do that in the solitary place? Give it a try. What's the worst thing that could happen? Like in fasting, you're going to get hungry, have a headache and that. You might meet God in the solitary place. What's the worst thing that can happen? What if God showed up? What happened then? And so Brennan Manning commissions it this way. Lord, I'm not free, but who wants to be? You're all that matters in my life. I don't want to be free of my hunger for your bread. I don't want to be free of my thirst for your word. I don't want to be free of my desire for your will. I don't want to be free of my longing for your presence. Hear this. I don't want to be free of my need to be taken up, taken over, and joined to you. Lord, but may I never be free from wanting you. Do you know where that kind of a heart's cultivated? In the solitary place. Let's get there, church. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your invitation. Thank you for Mark 6. Thank you for all the amazing ways, even today, we witness abounding in the work of the ministry, lives in the waters of baptism, stories of transformation and change. We rejoice in all the good works you're doing. And then we heed now a very clear invitation from you and your word to get to the abiding, solitary place for the sustaining strength we need for everything that's going on in our life. I pray for those this morning. There's some here right now to get real with what is in their life. There's just some really difficult things to work through. Minister to them by the Holy Spirit, I pray. Fight some battles, Lord, that only you can fight. And take away some scaffolding to remind us you will be God and that will be enough. In Jesus' holy name, amen.